Next presentation, uh, it's going to be on infant formula given by Dr. Layla Becker. And let's welcome Dr. Becker. Good day, I'm Lila Becker, and I work with the infant formula and medical food staff as a science reviewer. I review the science-based input and in clinical studies that may be included in an infant formula notification. So let's begin with the question of why infant formulas are regulated. A need for leg legislation was brought forward to Congress because of a serious ad adverse events that occurred in 1978. What happened? The addition of sodium chloride to infant formula was discontinued by one manufacturer between 1978 and 1979. And the result of that was more than 130 infants developed hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. This lack of chloride resulted in a serious alteration in the baby's acid-based balance, presenting as vomiting, nausea, and poor growth. A number of infants required hospitalization. So the first question, poll question I have for you today is how many think that the following statement is true or false? FDA regulates infant formulas as drugs since they are for infants. So while you are providing your answers, we'll begin to discuss how infant formulas are regulated. In um, Congress, in a joint bipartisan effort, enacted the Infant Formula Act in 1980 and amended that act in 1986. The 1986 amendments gave FDA more regulatory authority. The FDA amend the Infant Formula Act amended the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act by adding Section 412. And included in the act were regulations that pertain to the safe production, which are good manufacturing practices for the production of infant formula, and the nutritional sufficiency of infant formula as well as what, what results in an adulteration of an infant formula. And until the uh, recent uh, change in the uh, Food Modernization Act, uh, infant formula had um, the only mandatory recall authority was for infant formulas. Okay, so now let's just take a moment and see what you all thought was the correct answer for the, um, so, so some of you, oh, there it is. I'm sorry, there's a little um, distance in the screens here. So a good, uh, the, it looks like the results are still coming in, but most of you seem to uh, conclude that 80, more than 80% of you uh, have identified the correct answer. It's false. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration regulates infant formula as a food. And that's an important um, concept for us to understand uh, as we go forward. So congratulations to those of you who answered correctly. And uh, those of you who didn't will uh, begin to explain to you why the false was the right answer. The next um, questions we need to address are how are infant formulas regulated, since they're not regulated as a drug we've established, and what are the regulatory categories of infant formula. So from the answer, you saw that infant formulas are regulated as a food, but they have additional specific requirements that were added under the Infant Formula Act. So. It's also important to remember that because infant formula is a food, all of the applicable food laws apply to infant formula as well. So infant formula has its own specific law, and the regulations promulgated under that statute have the power of law. And there are legal consequences associated with violations and um, we need to t take a look at the two categories that are uh, 
that are regulated. They are called non-exempt and exempt formulas. But before we do that, I have another poll question for you because this is also relevant to our understanding of infant formula regulation. Under the regulations, an infant is defined as a person that is uh, any one of the four of uh, choices here, uh, what I'd like you to do is select the one that uh, you think is consistent with the FDA regulation. So you work on those poll questions and I'll try to click the right thing here. Okay, so let's continue and we'll come back to the answer to poll question number two shortly. So from a regulatory standpoint, what are infant formulas? Who are the intended users, and why is this important? We need to understand the regulatory parameters so that they are appropriately applied. And we'll discuss these categories in further details uh, in this talk. So what are infant formulas? Infant formulas, as you can see, are products that are intended uh, for the use by infants that simulate uh, milk, human milk, or are a, uh, and are suitable as a complete substitute for human milk or a partial substitute for human milk. And it's important to remember that infant formula is a unique food because unlike other foods, it may be the sole source of nutrition for an infant, whereas older children and adults have the opportunity to obtain nutrients we require from a variety of foods in our diet. Therefore, every batch of infant formula that enters the marketplace must be perfect. Okay, so the answer to poll question number two is C. And it looks like we have um, some input on, on that. I can't, let me just see if I can see a uh, good 70 plus percent of you have the uh, correct uh, regulatory definition of an infant. And uh, as I said, that's important for what, what foods, uh, then what, what foods are applied to uh, infant formulas. Um, so what type of uh, formulas are in the market? and uh, are there different intended users? So if we've talked about uh, the intended users of infant formulas are infants, and the infants that we are referring to under the regulation are persons that are less than 12 months of age. So in order to understand why the infant's age is relevant, um, it's relevant to the intended users. And, children, and products that are for children over the age of 12 months are not regulated under the Infant Formula Act. And so that is something that um, is, uh, is important to understand what products are regulated as infant formulas and what products are re uh, regulated under uh, conventional food law. Okay, infant formulas marketed in the United States are designed to meet the nutritional requirements of term infants or infants with disorders that require different formulations. As I mentioned just in a slide uh, earlier, there are two major categories. One category is for term infants with generally good health status, um, and of course we mean term infants uh, are infants that were uh, born 37 weeks um, gestational age or greater. And those are our non-exempt infant formulas. The other regulatory category applies to infants who may have inborn errors of metabolism, a low birth weight, or who otherwise have an unusual medical or dietary problem. So before we go on to um, the different formulations, let's go on to um, poll question number three, which is infant formula is a unique food because, and I will encourage you to pick the uh, answer you think most applicable. 
So while you're answering question number three, we're having you multitask today. Uh, let's think about uh, let's think about the types of products that are on the market for term infants. The products that are on the market for generally healthy term infants are often characterized by the mi macronutrient protein source. And those are sources of protein that are probably familiar to you. These are your cow milk-based formulas, your partially hydrolyzed cow milk pa uh, protein formulas, and soy protein isolate formulas. So why don't we take a moment and think about how a formula for the preterm infant might differ for, from a term infant. And in this talk, I will uh, be using low birth weight and preterm infant uh, interchangeably, although from a clinical standpoint, I know those aren't exactly always the same. But let's think about how a formula for the preterm, a low birth weight infant um, who is likely to be preterm, might differ from a term infant formula. So products for the preterm infant are cow-based products, infant formulas, that are modified to meet the increased levels of energy, protein, and certain vitamins and minerals that are needed by these infants. Uh, we usually don't see soy-based formulas for preterm infants uh, because they are not recommended um, because in studies of preterm infants that were fed soy formulas, they did not grow as well as formulas uh, that were milk-based. So are there other products for preterm infants that are regulated as infant formulas? Uh, and in fact, the answer to that question is yes. Other products for preterm infants are fortifiers for human milk. When when possible, human milk is uh, often preferred for preterm infants as well as for term infants. But we know from studies that human milk alone cannot meet the nutritional requirements of the preterm infant. So the products that are under um, this category are human milk fortifiers that might be in a powdered form that contain nutrients to augment the human milk. And these products are nutritionally incomplete by themselves. They are needed, uh, the human milk is needed. Um, they are just an add-on to the human milk. And then there are human milk fortifiers that come also in a liquid form that are concentrated. Um, and they are products that are some uh, usually cow milk based, or they may be um, concentrated human milk with additional uh, minerals that have been added. Uh, these products are nutritionally complete. So all of these products must be used under very close monitored conditions. Uh, they're usually uh, fed to infants while they're in the neonatal, neonatal intensive care units or the NICU. Products for infants with certain types of disorders that involve the gastrointestinal uh, tract are, are uh, such as malabsorption of various, uh, from various causes or disorders of an allergic origin may need a modification in the protein portion and other macronutrient modifications, uh, perhaps in lipids or in the carbohydrates. These formulations include formulas in which the casein has been extensively hydrolyzed, and they're obviously called extensively hydrolyzed casein formulas. Uh, for infants that need protein in an elemental form, there are amino acid-based formulas that contain all of the amino acids necessary, and they are nutritionally complete formulas. Some formulas may contain a modification in the lipid and would contain medium chain triglycerides uh, for infants that have issues with fat absorption. And then some formulas may contain a carbohydrate other than lactose, and um, they might have a sucrose or a glucose or some other carbohydrate source. And uh, so there are some formulations out there that have either one of these types of modifications in the macronutrient 
or they have modification in uh, all three macronutrients. Now the uh, products for infants with uh, metabolic disorders, inherited metabolic disorders, the uh, have a specialized formulations that are designed to meet the specific needs of their particular condition. The products are formulated with modification in the macronutrient source. Uh, often this is a protein. And the easiest example or the most common example uh, to, to provide to you is an amino acid product formulated without phenylalanine for the infants that have uh, phenylcontinuria or PKU. These types of products are not nutritionally complete, are often used in combination with a complete protein source, either human milk or um, a uh, complete uh, non-exempt infant formula. But they must be used with continued medical uh, monitoring. So now uh, let's just go back to our poll question and see uh, what the uh, answer you've provided. Oh, wow, 100% of you um, have identified that infant formula is a unique food because it may be an, uh, the infant's sole source of nutrition. So I think we should give you all a round of applause. That's a perfect answer. So. Um, and, and it's something to remind ourselves that infants do not have access to any other food. So as I said before, I may even say again, the infant formula must be perfect and meet all of the requirements uh, of the infant. So we have the regulatory categories. Now that you have an idea of how the infant formulas may be used, we can focus a little more on the regulatory categories. Uh, Non-exempt formulas, as we've already established, are used by healthy infant, term infants, and it must meet all of the criteria set forth in the Infant Formula Act. Exempt formulas are manufactured for use by infants with various disorders that we just described, the low birth weight or preterm, inborn errors of metabolism, or other unusual medical or dietary problems. And if applicable, those um, formulations are exempt from certain criteria set forth in the Infant Formula Act. And so using our example of PKU, that formula is allowed to have an incomplete protein, have the absence of phenylalanine because that uh, amino acid is toxic for those uh, infants with PKU. Okay, so what does the Infant Formula Act uh, provide for? Uh, the following requirements um, that include good manufacturing practices and quality con control procedures are uh, absolutely imperative. The term good, current good manufacturing practices, sometimes you'll see that as CGMP. Uh, and the statute requires manufacturers to use good manufacturing practices and follow accepted quality control procedures in the production of infant formula products. Uh, and that is so that each batch of infant formula is produced and the outcome of the production is the same for each, uh, each batch. Another key element of the Infant Formula Act is that it is a nutrition-oriented statute, and that states special conditions of use. Since we've said already that it's a unique food, then it, uh, and often the uh, sole source of nutrition during a very vulnerable period of infant uh, development, it uh, is essential that the good manufacturing practices and the nutritional content of these products uh, meet all of the elements required under the Act. Okay, so we have another poll question for you. Um, how many of you think the following statement is true or false? false? The FDA approves infant formulas before they can enter into commerce. So we'll give you a chance to work on, uh, on the answer there. And um, we'll just discuss some of the provision, additional provisions of the Infant Formula Act. Um, 
As stated a moment ago, the Infant Formula Act is a nutrition-oriented law. The nutrition, nutrient requirements for the infant formula include minimum levels for 29 nutrients and a maximum level for nine of these nutrients. And um, there are, of course, exemptions for the metabolic products and for formulas for preterm infants to these minimums and maximums. There's also something in the uh, Infant Formula Act called quality factors. The quality factor requirement in the Infant Formula Act means that a manufacturer must show that a formula provides nutrients in a form that is bioavailable and safe and that the formula supports healthy growth when fed as the sole source of nutrition. Now, a chemical analysis will show that a formula contains the required nutrients in the amounts needed, but on its own, it cannot demonstrate the bioavailability of these nutrients. The manufacturer must be able to assure the Food and Drug Administration that the formula in its entirety, as fed to the infant, is bioavailable. And uh, over the years, the way the manufacturers have demonstrated uh, the bioavailability and uh, this uh, component and the assurance is uh, through, a, uh, through healthy growth. They do studies on uh, infants and they follow their growth. So in addition to the requirements for the prevention of adulteration in other foods, infant formula has additional conditions. And these conditions of adulteration include uh, those nutrients we've just talked about. If the formula does not provide the nutrients as specified by law, it's adulterated. The final product testing has been, um, had, it, had that been required in 1978, the manufacturer would have known that there wasn't any uh, sodium chloride in the floor, uh, formula or an inadequate amount, and that formula would not have been able, uh, would not have entered the marketplace. Uh, if the processing is not in compliance with good manufacturing practices and quality proce control procedures, uh, or the formula does not meet the quality factor requirements, the product is adulterated. So there are additional requirements uh, for adulteration under in, for infant formulas. Okay, so an infant formula manufacturer uh, must test the product composition during the production and during the shelf life of the product. The manufacturer must also keep records on production, testing, and distribution of each batch of formula. So if the label says that there's a certain amount of uh, vitamin A, uh, by the time that product's shelf life is up, that level must be still in the product. The FDA inspects inf uh, infant formula plants every year, and uh, these inspections are of all facilities uh, and include compliance with the, uh, the good manufacturing practice and quality con control procedures, as well as reviewing that the manufacturer has maintained all necessary records and reports on their products. Uh, inspections of new facilities are conducted during uh, early production runs. And we may have special inspections uh, conducted if the FDA becomes aware of a potential uh, manufacturing or public health concern. If an infant formula product um, does not meet the nutrients or is adulterated or misbranded in other ways, it may be recalled, and the product may be, uh, it may be a voluntary recall or a mandatory recall. As I mentioned before, FDA had, um, has the authority to recall, uh, require a recall of infant formula. If an infant formula does not provide the required nutrients or is adulterated or misbranded in other ways, the firm itself uh, may initiate the recall and then inform FDA uh, at that time. If we determine, FDA determines, that there is a risk to human health, 
uh, the agency can uh, require a mandatory recall. So now let's go back to our poll question number four and see how you all did. Uh, FDA approves the infant formula before the formula can enter the market. Well, now uh, this almost looks like a, uh, an election qu question. It's uh, uh, split uh, almost 50-50. Uh, 53 percent of you think it's right and 47 percent of you uh, think it's false. Well, the correct answer is that it's false. We do not approve infant formulas before entering the market. What we have is a pre-market notification program. And uh, let's take a, a look at the, uh, these requirements so you can see why it's not, con not an approval process. Uh, Congress did not give us that authority. Uh, the other requirements are actually uh, the initial requirements a manufacturer must meet to market an infant formula. They include the registration of, a, of the manufacturer and the product, as well as 90 days prior to the formula entering the market, the manufacturer sends in a 90-day notification that includes, um, that includes all of the information about the product. So this is a pre-market notification program and not a pre-market approval program. When are the 90 uh, notifications required? A manufacturer that's a, a new, f a producing a new infant formula, uh, persons that have not previously manufactured an infant formula, um, someone that's come in from uh, another part of the world and they have not marketed in the United States, and whether there's been a major change to a formulation that's already in the market, all of these conditions, there must be a 90-day uh, pre-market notification to the FDA. I think we want to just take a quick look at what in is included under a major change because uh, that's important to understand. It may be a new formula, a new manufacturer, the addition of a new macronutrient, a substantial change to the macronutrient profile, uh, a new ingredient, a new in technology, or a new uh, packaging uh, is, is used. So 90 days before um, a uh, product goes to market, the manufacturer has to include a quantitative formulation of the, of the formula, the change description, a rationale for that change description, and assurances that the formula will not be marketed unless it meets the quality factors and that it meets all of the requirements of the CGMPs and uh, quality control. Okay, so I um, am seeing that I'm running a little short on time. And so these are the uh, things I just mentioned for the 90-day pre-market notification for the exempt formula. And there's a little bit difference in that they have to include the medical, nutritional, scientific, or technological rationale for the deviation uh, to allow them to be considered exempt. And uh, what types of reviews are needed for an infant formula? They may include, depending on the notification, nutrition, clinical, uh, ingredients, uh, food additive, food contact surfaces. It all depends on the notification. Um, so we know in summary that the pre-market notification is not an approval of the product and uh, FDA can object to the product or the notification that uh, doesn't meet the requirements under the Act. And in terms of ingredients, all ingredients must be approved for use in infant formula, and that's done and evaluated through the Office of Food Additive Safety. And um, there are some specific requirements for labeling, and we have it in picture as well as in uh, description. 
and uh, it's a specific label for the infant formula uh, that is per 100 calories as opposed to the uh, daily value. There's also caution about improper, um, improper preparation of infant formula and how uh, d dangerous that can be for, for the infant. Uh, there's plenty of information on our website regarding uh, infant formula, uh, uh, FAQs, frequently uh, asked uh, questions, and you're more than welcome to go to that site. Um, so here's Shirley, and uh, she will yes. proceed with uh, the questions. Uh, thank you very and much. Um, we are really um, going to have to move to our next presentation. We will not be able to take questions on this presentation. Um, so, but we thank you, and definitely do check out the website, um, and uh, please try to find your answer there as well and the, because the website provides uh, a lot of information on infant formula. So thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Becker.